Thank you for choosing to watch our video. Please like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon for notifications of new content. Leave us a comment and watch the other videos that we're happy to provide for you. And now, on to the sermon. Truly, it's good to be with you this morning and to open the Word, to study from it, <clears throat> and to seek from it to be edified by the things that are contained therein. As we look at the Scriptures, we're going to look at some passages from the book of Hebrews this morning. A passage that we looked at a few weeks back and we are going to continue that this morning. The book of Hebrews was a book that was written for those that were Christians, as the epistles were. But there were these, these were ones that were for a special order of Christians. These were Christians that had been ones among the first that had obeyed the gospel. They were Jews. They were familiar with all of the principles of uh, the law. They were aware of uh, the Moses, mosaic situations and went all the way back to the days of uh, Moses when Moses gave the law. And these had become Christians, uh, for they recognized that the first covenant was temporary and something that was to only last for a period of time. But there were those among them that became discouraged, and they were ones that were inclined to return once more to the law and to those that they were so familiar with. And so the purpose of the book of Hebrews is to teach them that there is a danger in turning away from what they had learned, and they need to remain with that that they had embraced, for therein lay all their hope and all of their expectations. In the first chapter of the book of Hebrews, there is a contrast that is made. And that contrast that is made is between Jesus, the Son of God, and angels. Notice how it begins by saying, God, having of old time spoken unto the fathers in the prophets, in divers portions, and in divers manners, have at the end of these days spoken unto us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the effulgence of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he made purification for sin sin, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become by so much higher than angels. <clears throat> the writer of the, the purpose and the intent of the writer in these verses is to show something. It is to show the exalted nature of Jesus Christ. And the balance of that first chapter is a contrast between Jesus as God's Son and angels as a created being that God had made. There is a contrast, as the writer shows repeatedly, how that Jesus is higher than angels. God said to Jesus when he brought him into the world that the angels would worship him. Never did God ever say that to, to any angel. God said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of thy kingdom. God never said that to any angel. God spake and said of his son, Sit thou at my right hand till I make all thine enemies the footstool of thy feet. God never said that to any angel. But rather, as he speaks of that, he concludes by saying of angels, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to do service for the sake of them that inherit salvation? And then having made the point emphatically and beyond dispute that angels are inferior to Jesus Christ, the apostle or the writer continues in the second chapter. He said, therefore, that is because that Christ is higher than angels and Christ is that that is the very nature and character of God and God has spoken to him this day. Therefore, we ought to give the earnest heed to the things that we've heard lest happily we should drift away from them. He gives here a revelation of what the nature of the book is going to be as he shows that these individuals had listened to Christ, they had followed Christ, and now they must continue to follow Christ or else they'll lose their reward and they'll lose all that they could hope for. 
He said, For if the word spoken by angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first was spoken by the Lord, was confirmed unto us by them that heard? Notice what he says. He says, God spoke unto us by his Son. He's made him one that is Lord of all. He said, sit at my right hand till I make all your enemies the footstool of your feet. He has contrasted Jesus as higher, eminently higher than angels. And yet, God gave and spoke in times past to the prophets, and he gave the law by angels. And yet, although God gave the law by angels, and they they were inferior to the one that spoke in these last days. Nevertheless, that law was expected to be observed, and those that did not observe the things that those angels spoke on the behalf of God were duly ones that were punished for their rebellion or their failure to serve God. And then having said that, he said, how shall we escape? He would neglect so great a salvation, which at the first was spoken by the Lord, was confirmed unto us by them that heard God bearing witness with them both by signs and wonders and manifold powers and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. God confirmed the word through Jesus, and he confirmed the word through the apostles. And then... Having said that, he speaks of the things we want to talk about today. He said, For not unto angels did he subject the world to come of which we speak. Notice that he has spoken of the fact that God has spoken to us through the word of Jesus Christ. And as he speaks of angels who are inferior to Christ, he says it wasn't the angels that God subjected the world to come. And what he has reference to is the last verses of that first chapter, right? In which he says, For unto which of the angels did God say at any time, Sit thou at my right hand until I make all thine enemies the footstool of thy feet? It was to the Son that God said that. It was not to angels that he subjected the world to come. And then, having said that, he spoke these words. For someone hath somewhere testified, saying... And he's going to quote something that is a familiar statement taken from the old law. It is taken from the book of Psalms, from the 8th chapter of the book of Psalms. And this is what that passage says. What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast made him a little lower than angels. Thou hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou hast set him over all the works of thy hand. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. And in that he saith, all things are subjected to him. Nothing is remaining that is not subjected unto him. It is a passage that calls to mind what God spoke when he thought about the creation of man. Remember, the Bible said that in the first chapter of the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then the foreign and following in the natural order, the things that took place day by day, of what he did the first day, of the second day, of the third day, and finally of the sixth day, the final day of creation. It was on that day that he created all the animals of the field, and then God God said, speaking to those that were God, the Spirit, the Son, and the Father, God said, let us make man. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let's give them dominion over all the works that we've created, of the fish of the sea, of the things that are there. And so God did make man in his likeness. And as the writer of the book of Psalms speaks, he speaks of what God intended for man. God intended to place man on a high and a lofty position. He intended for him to be one that would be over everything as far as the earth is concerned. But man forfeited that. Man sinned. And 
when man sinned, it was not that that was attainable to reach the final state as far as perfect man was concerned. And so a perfect man was sent to this world to accomplish that which he had intended for man to begin with. And that perfect man was Jesus Christ. Notice he said, for in that he subjected all things unto him, he left nothing that is not subjected unto him. But then the writer says, but now... We see not yet all things subjected unto him. And as we look at that, we see that no, everything is not subjected unto the Son. No, as we look, sin still is that that is that that is flaunted day by day. And sometimes it looks like that the things are getting worse and worse as far as sin is concerned. And not only do we see sin, man flaunting the law of God, but we see something else. We see that there is still the pervading measures of illness. Our congregation has not escaped it. We've seen those that are within us that have been seriously ill, and some that presently are seriously ill. And it is something that is going to be with us as long as this world so stands. But not only is that true, we see there is something else that has not been subjected yet. And there is still death. And death still is that that reigns. And still has its stranglehold as far as mankind is concerned. Yes, ultimately these things will be put under the feet of Jesus. But he says, we see not yet all things that are subjected unto him. But now notice the next verse in which the writer says, but, verse 9, but we behold him who hath been made a little lower than the angels, even Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he should taste of death for every man. We don't see all things subjected under his feet, but we do see something. We see Jesus, who has been made a little lower than angels. Isn't that interesting? In the first chapter, he emphasizes the fact that Jesus is higher than angels, and how exalted that he is. And it wasn't under angels that he subjected the world, but it is to the Son. But now in this second chapter, we see him talking about Christ, and he's been made a little lower than angels. Now, this wasn't something that was going to continue, and it wasn't something that exists even today. But rather, what he is speaking of when Jesus was made a little lower than angels was when Jesus came to this world. When he came to this world, and he took on himself the robe of flesh. The writer of the Philippian letter speaks of it well. Remember what he said. In Philippians, the second chapter, have this mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, counted not being on equality with God a thing to be rest, but he emptied himself, taking on himself the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of man, and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, the death of the cross. Wherefore, God highly exalted him, and gave to him the name that is above every name, that of the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven of things on earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father notice that in the first chapter he talks about God's made him having made since he made purification for sin when he made purification for sin that God set him at his right hand he made him higher than the angels but there was a period of time in which that Christ was made lower than angels. Lower than angels because he took on himself the nature of man. And he was made in the likeness of man. Notice how the writer talks it. That Jesus was made a little lower than angels because of the suffering of death. And when he suffered death, then the Bible says Following that, he was crowned with glory and honor because by the grace of God, notice, by the grace of God he might do something. Huh? What was it that by the grace of God he might do? Taste of death. How could that be by the grace of God? 
him tasting of death. Did that mean that he died so that I would never die? No, I'm going to die. And you're going to die. Every one of us are going to die. We're going to, unless Jesus comes. But the Bible says that the living know that they shall die. It's appointed unto man who wants to die. And yet the writer says that because of the sufferings of death, by God's grace, he tasted of death for every man. And how could he do that? Well, he could do it only by lowering himself, by becoming lower than an angel, by taking on himself the form of man as a servant and so he did and he did so that he might taste the death for every man that he may not know what and how it is to die and so having said that in verse 10 the writer says for it became him for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. And there's a contrast in this text in the second chapter. And sometimes the text is speaking about God the Father. And sometimes the text is speaking about God the Son. And in this text, when he says, it became him for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. He's talking about the Father. The Father who purposed redemption for you. The Father who purposed redemption for me. The Bible teaches that God loved the world. And he gave his only begotten son. And this was something that was purposed in the mind of God long before that man was born on this world. It was something that he purposed that if man sinned, he was going to make a provision for man. And so God purposed something to bring many sons to glory. And notice how he describes the father. He said, through whom are all things, and to whom belong all things. To him belongs the glory. To him belongs the praise. We need to give him the glory for the creator that he is, and through whom are all things. It is through him that we live, and we move, and we have our being. It is through him that the world will form through the agency of the Son. For the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But in John the first chapter, the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that had been made. Through him are all things. Every living thing finds its ultimate source in the Father and the Son. As we look at the planets that are ones that are in the universe, and the stars, and the naked eye can't distinguish between the star and the planet, but God can. And it's that that you can't count, but God knows the number of them all. And every one of them owe oh, their origin to God. And then look and look at the ant that crawls on the, the ground. And oftentimes, how many times have you stepped on an ant unawares and snuffed out the life of that little creature? Well, you may have been unaware of it that was under your feet, but that little ant owed its existence and it's life to God. And God knew when the life of that little creature was snuffed out. And the Bible says it became him. For whom are all things and through whom are all things. In bringing many sons to glory. Now it's talking about Jesus Christ. To, to make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. I thought Jesus was perfect. He is perfect. But there was something that was that. That was that that he had not gone through. Uh, so things that he needed to be tested in. Uh, 
And so God, in seeking to make the author of my salvation and the author of your salvation perfect, found it necessary and His grace to make it perfect through the suffering of His Son. And then the Bible says regarding Him that both He that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all of one. Now he's talking about Christ. And he's talking about me. Notice he said that he that sanctifieth, that's Jesus Christ. And he that is sanctified, that's me. If I believe in him, that's you. If you believed in him, because we are sanctified by that which he did for us. The Bible says if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus uncleanseth us from all sins. And to these same Hebrews, he warned them that uh, if we deny him, uh, that uh, there is consequences, and they said in regard to that, that there are those that turn their back and they trample underfoot the blood of the covenant by which they are sanctified. Now he said, he that sanctifies Christ and they that are sanctified, me and you, if we've been covered by the blood of Christ, are all of one. What does he mean? All of one. Christ is one of something that I'm one of. What is it that Christ is one of that I'm one of? Why, well, friends, brethren, he means we are all one humanity. He became flesh. He was made in the likeness of man. He took on the form of a servant. Remember, John said, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the Father, uh, only begotten of the Father. For he shows his kinship to man by Jesus saying these words. And he quotes from the Old Testament prophets of what Jesus would say. And this is what Jesus said. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation I will sing thy praise. Jesus said I'll care, call, I will declare your praise. I will declare your glory to my brethren. And who are his brethren? You and me because he that sanctifies Jesus and he that is sanctified mankind are all of one one humanity he was made like us in that sense and in that respect and then he said again I will put my trust in him and again behold I and the children which God hath given unto me, intended as to be words of Jesus about mankind, that uh, we're all one, because he partook of humanity of the flesh, and because I partook and partake of humanity the flesh. In verse 14, he draws on that conclusion. And he says, since then the children are sharers in flesh and blood, he in like manner partook of the same. The children, the children of Jesus, the brethren of Jesus, since they are sharers in flesh of the man, he, the same, he partook of the same. That is, he that sanctifies the Son, the Son of God, he partook of the same. Why? Why did he do that? And it all ties back with the fact that by the grace of God he tasted of death for every man. Why did he do that? Well, that through death he might do something. That through death he might bring to naught him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And it might deliver all of those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage. Why did he partake of the flesh? Because he could die only if he was in the form of a flesh. And God was making him a perfect high priest for me. 
one that could feel my infirmities. One could know what I'm experiencing when I go through the things as far as life is concerned. And so because I'm flesh and you're flesh, the Bible says he also partook of the same, that through death, that is because he became flesh, that through death he might bring to naught him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And what the apostle and the writer is telling us here is, is that Jesus became the sacrifice for me. He became the means by which I can have forgiveness of sins. He offers himself as a perfect sacrifice. Blood that can do what the blood of bulls and goats cannot do. He is one that in the word of John, 1 John 2, My little children, these things I write unto you that you may not sin. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the perpetuation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the whole world. And so he came that he might die and that he might pay a price that I could be forgiven. That's why he came. That's why he took on himself the form of a servant. That's why he took on flesh. But then there was something else that he through flesh could do. And that was that he might deliver all of them who through fear of death where they're subject to bondage. I know I'm going to die. And the older we get, the more conscious we are. We look at things of a decade, and uh, most of you could think, well, in a decade, this will be taking place, and I will live to see it. I have no such expectation. That would mean I would be 102 years old. <laughs> I don't expect to live that long. I don't. I have a sister, or had a sister, that almost reached 99, but none of my immediate family, my siblings, my father, my mother, grandparents, none of them attained such an age as that. I know I'm going to die. And you know you're going to die. Death is certain. Is there fear? Well, perfect love casts out fear, the record says. But yes, there's some anxiety because there's the uncertainty. What lies on the other side? Through faith, we believe that there is a better world. Through faith, there is the measure of a better home. That's through faith. And none of us have ever seen anybody that's came back from that other world to tell us, yes, it's real. Yes, there is a resurrection. And that was the benefit of Christ's death, you see. Because the gospel is this, the gospel. We're supposed to be preaching and announcing all the time and all over the world. And Paul said to the Corinthians, I preached it to you. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried and was raised from the dead the third day, according to the scriptures. Jesus said, I'm going to die for you. And he did. And Paul said that scarcely for a righteous man will one die. For adventure for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God commended his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And he was buried. But here's a joyful news and is raised from the dead the third day. If you take that latter part away from the gospel, what is the gospel? It just leaves me on a world with forgiveness of sins. But what can I hope for or look for as far as this life and when this life is over with? You see, it's the third thing that is to do with the gospel that makes the gospel so real, so meaningful, and that is this. I can rise again. I will be raised. Death is not the end of it. The very first letter that Paul wrote, he wrote to the church at Thessalonica. Many of them were Jews that had become Christians, and many were Gentiles. But there was a factor about which they were all disturbed, and that was, what's going to happen to our loved ones when they die? And some of them apparently had died. 
So Paul writes that he might encourage them regarding that uncertainty of theirs. And so he says in the 13th verse of the 5th chapter, We would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them that fall asleep, that you sorrow not, even as the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so also them that are fallen asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you with the word of the Lord, that we that are alive, that are left under the coming of the Lord shall in no wise precede them that are fallen asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we that are alive, that are left, shall together with them be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And because we believe in Jesus and believe that he's raised, it gives us hope of a resurrection as well. In verse 16, the writer says, For verily, not to angels doth he give help. Angels are can. But verily, not to angels doth he give help. Who does he give help to? He gives help to the seed of Abraham. When he talks about help, what kind of help is he talking about? What he just talked about in the preceding verse. That through death he might bring to naught him that had the power of death. That is the devil. And he might deliver all them who through fear of death were their lifetime subject to deliver them. He doesn't give help to angels in delivering them from the fear of death. But he does give help to the seed of Abraham. He does give help to them. And the seed of Abraham? Just those that are physical children of Abraham or his descendants? Is that what he's talking about? That only those that are comforted by what Christ did are ones that are physically descendants of Abraham? No. He's not talking about those that are physical descendants. They have, may have no blood connection to Abraham at all. But a man can be of a seed of Abraham and have no physical connections with him blood-wise because he's got a stronger connection with Abraham. For the writer says in the book of Galatians, So then, they that are of faith, notice, they that are of faith are children are seed of Abraham. And then in the same chapter, he said, you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ did put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. You're all one man. And Christ Jesus, now listen to him. Eh? And if you're Christ, are you? Are you Christ? If you're Christ, then are you Abraham's what? seed, children. He gives help to Abraham's seed, to Abraham's children, to those that walk in the steps of Abraham. Who was Abraham? We all know who Abraham was. He lived 4,000 years ago. And he was a man that is viewed by not only those that call themselves Christians or Jews, but Muslims as well. That's part of the society of our world, look back to Abraham. But the Bible teaches us that Abraham was a man of unexcelled faith. He wasn't, in, he wasn't perfect. He was a man that sinned. But he was a man of unequaled, as far as his day was concerned, faith. He lived in a time in which idolatry was that that reigned. Yet somehow he had come to believe in God. And God spoke to him and said, Abraham, get up. Go from your father's house to a land I will show you. And he went to a land he didn't know where he was going. And when he got there, God says, look at it. All of this, Abraham, is that that's going to be yours. And I'm going to give it to you and your family. 
and I'm going to give you a family, Abraham. Look up and look at the stars. Can you count them all? Well, if you can count them all, you can count your posterity. Uh, because I'm going to make your seed as numerous as the stars of heaven. Uh, and one final thing in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And the Bible says, and Abraham believed God. Well, if he had ten children, well, he had reason to believe. But when God spoke those words to Abraham, he didn't have any children. But he believed God. And then the year went on. And another year went on. And another year went on. And still he and Sarah had no children. Finally, when he was almost a hundred years old, God gave him Isaac. And he said, now Abraham, this is the one. This is the one that is your apostle, that is your one that shall father the ones of the nations that I spoke about. And Isaac grew. And one day a strange command came to Abraham from God. This was his only son. And God had specifically said, Abraham, in Isaac shall your seed be called. And Isaac was a youth. He had no children. But God said, Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. How more specific could he be? Take him and offer him as a burnt sacrifice to me. What did Abraham do? He took his son. He laid him on the altar. He was about to take his life and God says, Abraham, do your son no harm? Now I see, I know. You, you believe me. And who are Abraham's seed? There are those of us that had that same kind of faith that believed God, that believed the Bible is His Word, that believed there was such a man as Jesus that walked upon this earth, that there were twelve men that were apostles that saw Him, saw Him as He lived, saw Him as He died, saw Him after He was resurrected and pronounced to the world, He's risen, He's coming again, and through His sacrifice, remission of sin is possible. Of individuals that walk by faith and not by sight. But the writer is not done. Wherefore, it behooved him in all things to be made like unto his brethren. All things, flesh, that he might die. It behooved him in all things that he might be made like unto his brethren. Why? That he might become a merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. For, in that he himself was tempted, look at the words of comfort that follow this last statement. For, in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able, what's he able to do? He's able to succor them that are tempted. What was the benefit of Jesus dying? Well, we discussed that. What was the object of Jesus coming in the flesh? Uh, well, it was so that he could be a man. That he could experience what it is to walk in the kind of paths that sometimes we walk in. What was the benefit of him coming to this earth? Well, that he might die. They might be raised from the dead, but that he might know, that might understand. The Bible says we have not an high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but one that at all points been tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Someone faces death, and Jesus comforts them. Why? Because he knows what it is to die. He knows. He experienced death. And when one dies, you're not doing something that the Lord has not done. He died. He was raised. But He died. And He can empathize with you. 
when someone has a loved one that dies. And we're helpless as we see them pass from this life to another life. The Lord knows that too. He stood at the tomb of Lazarus. And though he knew that Lazarus was going to come forth and these grieving sisters would see their tears turn to joy, nevertheless, Jesus looked at them and he loved Lazarus. And he wept, the shortest verse in all the Bible, because he could sympathize. When I have sorrows and things that are pain, he knows he has suffered and knows what it is for somebody to be a friend and stab him in the back. He knows that. He knows what it is to stand and stand almost alone. Alone. For when the night came and the soldiers grabbed him and took him away, how many of his disciples stood with him? Not a one. They all forsook him. Please. He is our merciful, our faithful high priest. And God, by grace, allowed him to suffer the things that he did. That's why, brethren, friends, we can sing what a friend we have in Jesus. That's why, brethren, it is such a measure of disrespect, of disregard, of contempt uh, to turn one's back upon Jesus uh, who paid it all for us, who says, I will not have anything to do with uh, the gospel you sent me. I am not willing to submit to what you said I must do to have forgiveness of sin. I'm not willing to be faithful to those things. What a measure of contempt for him, toward him, who paid such a price for us and loved us so. He is a faithful and merciful high priest. And he's one that's been tempted like we. And God, in his love for me and for you, says his son, did that to die for me, but to walk in the steps that men walk in, so that I know when I pray to him, He's able to succor me, strengthen me. And he can say to me, I know. Are you here this morning and not his child? Why not? One who would leave heaven and come to earth and know the contempt that man shows upon him to be despised and rejected, to know the soldiers that nailed his hand to the cross, to see his disciples walk away from him, did all that for me. And for you, uh, you're not a Christian, why not? Do you believe that Jesus is God's Son? And why don't you come today? Confess your faith that He is. Repent of your sins. Be baptized into Him for remission of sin. Or perhaps you need to correct things in your life that are remiss. And why not do that? If you're a subject of the invitation, come while we stand, while we sing.